conductive way And you were so electric I had no say when you came so near And just passed right through me Hey everyone, welcome to Geekdom is Back, and I'm joined by a brand new guest today. That seems to be a theme of 2020 here, but I am joined by A.L. Levy to discuss Sicario. A.L., how are you doing? Very, very good. How are you doing? Not bad. Just doing lots of podcasts, as I know you are, too. Yeah, well, I just posted something. I basically was asking people if their life in quarantine is any different than their life out of quarantine, and mine's really not that different. So I'm just podcasting more because I know people are home, but... How different is it for you? Honestly, the only thing that I'm not doing is going to the movies or to the library like the nerd that I am. So I just, you know, read books at home and watch movies at home instead now. (laughs) Libraries still exist? Yes, apparently. I had no idea. (laughs) I'm completely serious. I had no idea. Like, do they rent books or is it all digital? Like, how does... They do both. All right. How do you feel about digital books? I've had a Kindle for like five years now, so I will read any book any way you give it to me. (laughs) Okay, got it. Yeah, I don't understand why people aren't cool with that. I used to remember traveling with 15 books in my bag, and it just sucked. I like having it all on a phone now. Yeah, I mean, I'm guilty of having a ginormous book collection. I know video wasn't working here, but if it had been working, you would have seen like the massive amount of books behind me. (laughs) So I kind of use it as a noise dampener for when I podcast. It works. It does, actually. Bookcases are actually good diffusers. Yeah, that's why I put five of them in here. I was like, I have enough books to fill all five. So, Yeah, it's actually, it's the un, the uneven surfaces uh, created by all the books. That's why it works. The more you know. So if anyone wants to podcast in a room that is not ideal, just stack books all around you. Yeah, just do anything to make the walls uneven, basically. Because, you know, the books will be stacked with random lengths and... They're never going to actually all be sticking out the exact same amount, which will make the sound bouncing off of them go in random directions. So it helps. Yeah. Well, let's dive into some movie talk here. All right. Before we dive into Sicaria, though, I do want to talk a little bit about Prisoners, because when we were figuring out what we wanted to talk about, you mentioned that I should watch Prisoners before watching Sicario. So I went ahead and did that. What was your reasoning behind wanting me to watch that one as well? Well, because I think that Denis Villeneuve is an incredible director. And I think to get a feel for his work as a whole, I think is important if you're going to talk about Sicario. Because if you don't know his work, you might think of Sicario as like more of an action movie kind of or Mm -hmm. a thriller, which it is. But uh, if you know more of his body of work, see that there are kind of more like really intense art films. Sicario is just one more in a in a line of those, basically. So really just for context. Right. I had watched Arrival before, so I was familiar with at least one piece of his work. So to just have a few under my belt now, it seems like it kind of, like you said, comes together and you see the bigger picture behind the work he does. But Prisoners was a great watch. I watched it on HBO and it should still be up there for anyone who wants to check that out if you are bored and need a new movie to watch, even though it's not super new. But Sicario is one that really grabbed my attention pretty much right off the bat because it's so intense the entire time. You're just kind of like, oh, I literally cannot look away from this. Yeah, it's intense and it's also super, super dark without being cheesy. Sometimes yeah, when movies are trying to be dark, they will, I don't know, they'll get campy or something. But this one has just this super authentic darkness to it that I personally love. I love that in art. And then also the other thing about it is I uh, kind of grew up in Mexico, part of my youth, and there's something super authentic about it. So when I was watching it for the first time, I was like, wow, this this feels so real. I'm sure that a lot of it is Hollywoodized and there's definitely that element to it. But the the way that he captured how evil the drug trade is and how it affects uh, Mexican life and that whole aspect, it was so damn authentic mm-hmm. that that is kind of what pulled me in. Lots of times I've noticed that when people do movies about drug trade, 
they glamorize it yeah. a lot and they they make it seem kind of like the way that mob movies are made where it makes them seem like they've got this really cool lifestyle and they're like cool characters and in reality they're fucking thugs that <laughs> yeah. murder people right yeah a lot it seems like the cartel movies make them seem like also like it's this glamorous lifestyle in reality they're chopping people's heads off and hanging them from bridges and throwing them in vats of acid it covered that very authentically yeah while i have not been to mexico and did not live there at any point i grew up in southern california so i had times where i would go down towards san diego and end up like there's a border checkpoint that isn't at the border it's i want to say like maybe 30 miles before it so even just those scenes felt very real with the amount of traffic the amount of people coming and going and it's little things like that that really make the movies better because you'll see some movies that take place in LA and then the freeway is like empty and I'm like no that is never literally never happening and with the drug trade you could tell that it was an authentic story because not only do we already know that the United States did have to bring some order to the drug trade, it was one of those things where it was also very much a revenge story for Alejandro's character. And you're like, yes, if someone killed someone's daughter and wife, the husband would surely want revenge. Yeah, uh, he would want it. But the part that I think is not real life is that he'd actually be able to take the revenge. Yeah. In real life, I think that you kind of are powerless. They're so powerful in real life. The way that they touched on it was by showing that cop uh, who was turned. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that's very, very real in Mexico is that you don't know if the police are good guys or bad guys. And Yeah. If uh, if you're getting pulled over, uh, you don't know if you're about to get kidnapped or get a ticket. Typically, you can just slip them a 20 and get out of it. But the police, or at least a huge portion of the police, are owned by the cartels. They highlight that very, very well, both on the bridge scene where they go into Mexico and then also, I guess, the cop with his own family that gets killed at the end. It's really good, in my opinion, how they address it. Because one of the things, too, is that they didn't just make it seem like these cops are bad people or mm -hmm. corrupt because they're evil. It's more like they have no choice. It's a survival tool, basically, for them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a saying that comes from Colombia, that Plato Plomo, which it means silver or lead. That's kind of the way that when cartels approach people that's basically the deal you get either you accept their money and work with them or you're dead that's it there's no way out of it or around it plus you have all of the characters in this movie where you can tell who understands how things work and then you have characters like kate who clearly have spent so much time working on other types of cases that she really doesn't grasp just what it is going to be like. You can't just get rid of the drug cartel. Sometimes you have to just make it to where it is manageable. And her character really takes a ton of abuse in this because <laughs> of how she thinks differently from people like Matt and Alejandro. Yeah, actually, I think Kate is... One of the best female leads I've seen ever, maybe, because there's something about her that's so realistic in the fact that she's a very strong minded person. But it's not like it's not like she's going to start like shooting fire or be able to beat up like eight dudes at yeah. once. Like it's very, very real the way that she basically gets handled in, in the movie. And I think that they're using her to illustrate the moral ambiguity of the whole topic mm -hmm. because I think that everybody involved on the good side obviously would love it if you could just do things by the book, make the cartels go away, like bust them like drug dealers and that's that, but it's impossible. There's no way. They basically are more powerful than the government in some ways in Mexico. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw this, but recently in real life, there was a Mexican Marines raid on the son of this drug lord and this huge shootout. It's on video and 
basically they caught him at some house and they got him to come out the door and he made a phone call and then they let him go. It's all on video. Wow. It's yeah. Like that shit is totally real. And I think that the, uh, the idea of doing things for the greater good and whatever the greater good is involves having to bend rules sometimes. Yeah. It's not always one thing is right or wrong. Sometimes you have to make these sacrifices morally to just be able to do what is going to be best for everyone. And that certainly shows this well. And also just the fact that the movie title itself means Hitman. You know you're in for a bloodbath as well, even though it isn't like super bloody because you have that opening portion where they find all the bodies in the walls. So it's like obviously someone has killed them, but you're not seeing this huge bloodbath right away because they've been sort of preserved in the walls. And then you have the big explosion outside that causes them to lose agents and you have the bodies that are hanging once they go into Juarez, which I think those two scenes alone are just so powerful as far as the imagery goes. Yeah, totally. Also, a little key detail is all that stuff is shot in Mexico City because Juarez in real life is way too dangerous. Yeah. Uh, they There's no way that they could have actually pulled it off in Juarez. But the thing that the way I would call the violence in the movie is precise because there's actually not that much of it. There's not that much bloodbath like like you're saying, and there's really not that much action. But when it does happen, it's so intense and it's built up so perfectly that it like really scratches the itch perfectly. It's super expert, especially that bridge scene. And especially when Alejandro kills the entire family you know you think for a moment that he's going to spare the children because they are innocent but because his daughter was not spared in the same way he just goes all out and is like all right here's all the shots and i'm gonna leave you standing so you can watch them die one thing i really hate in movies is those moments of like do gooding Mm -hmm. where like someone is going to should be killing somebody else but then they don't they let them go or they kind of take the high road. I, that's always bothered me for some reason. So when he actually killed the dude's family, it's like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Not that I like watching kids get shot. Right. But it it was just so much more like it would go down, in my opinion. I think that if if this were to happen in real life, I don't think that the guy's family would be spared because – People's families are not spared in the drug war. Entirely, entire families are wiped out yeah. on either side. I don't think that Alejandro is necessarily like a quote unquote good guy. He's just a protagonist. And I think that's two totally different things, even though I do agree with uh, with his mission. You can tell it's been wearing him down, too, because it's not like the death of his wife and his daughter happened last week. It's something that he's been working towards for years. And you kind of get this sense that Kate reminds him of someone just because of the way he treats her. He definitely isn't as harsh at first like Matt is with her. So you get this sort of build up with their relationship. And in the end, Alejandro is going to do what he needs to do to benefit himself. And he clearly likes Kate and understands where she's coming from. But in the end, he's not going to let her get in the way of what he needed to accomplish either. That last scene is really powerful. Yeah. I do think that that's like the definition of business, not personal. Mm -hmm. I think he would have totally blown her head off if she hadn't signed it without without like flinching about it. You know what I realized? I don't know why I didn't connect this before. Like it is so obvious, but that's her gun. Yeah. So it was going to be made when he said you would be committing suicide. I didn't connect that it was going to be made to look like a suicide. Yeah, because I think she went to, like, look for her gun and realized that he was sitting right next to where she keeps it, which is pretty much just on the counter, which doesn't seem all that safe or smart. But it was one of those things where it took a minute for that to click with me, too. And then I was like, oh, that makes sense. Yeah. And he put it up under her chin as if the way that 
you would do if you were going to blow your own head off. Yeah. Like it, uh, it, that's, that's exactly what that was. Uh, also, man, God, she gets, <laughs> she, she gets run through the ringer so much in the movie. Especially when Matt like throws her to the ground outside the tunnel and you're just like, okay, all right, Josh Berlin, you're kind of a big dude. Don't get too carried away. She did punch him in the face. Yeah, <laughs> fair. Yeah, I mean, she came out swinging. She decked him. To be fair, he could have gone way harder. Yeah, true. She could put up a fight. That scene after the bar where she almost sleeps with the dude that's supposed to take her out. Yeah. You know, she puts up a really good fight. So I think that she's the kind of person that would need to be restrained or else she wouldn't stop. And you have to sort of believe in that moment they would have been treating Reggie the same way, too, if he had reacted the same way that Kate did. Yeah, well, I mean, they pinned him down and pointed a gun at his head. Yeah, so it's not something like, oh, she's the woman and she's sort of more emotional than everyone else. It was just, hey, you don't know how this works, so we are going to put the two of you in your place during this operation. I actually thought that Reggie was way more emotional about things yeah. than she was. He he was a little bitch, I thought. <laughs> um, I, I didn't like his character at all. And I've known people like that, too, mm -hmm. who just they need everything in life to be spelled out for them. And if things deviate even a little bit from the way they think they're supposed to be, they just can't handle it. And they, they can't they don't have an easy time uh, thinking in an abstract way and adjusting their thinking to the reality of the situation. Plus, you have the fact that his character didn't really add a ton to the story. One of the main purposes he seemed to serve was introducing her to the friend who was trying to take her out. Yeah, that and also kind of being like the anchor, I guess, like in a way, like the way that she likes to do things by the book. I think that he's kind of serving the purpose of being her anchor to that, because if she didn't have him, I think that it would have just been her alone with Matt and Alejandro, and it would have been a lot easier, I think, to persuade her okay. by the end of the movie yeah. to their way of thinking. But the fact that her BFF was with her almost the entire time, being like, no, these dudes are fucked up. I've met these kinds of dudes before. You don't want to mess with what they're doing. You can walk away from this whole thing. I mean, if you have that in your ear the whole time, it's going to make you resistant too, I think. Yeah, and she's a pretty stubborn character already, you can tell, because of how she likes to do things. And you also can tell that the two of them spend a ton of time together because she's just changing, coming out of the bathroom or shower or whatever. And he's like, girl, we need to get you a new bra kind of thing. <laughs> and you can tell that they've just spent so much time together. It's not even a romantic thing. It's just like, okay, you need to get your life together. Yeah. He's basically there to illustrate where she's at, I think, mm -hmm. um, because there's no other way that we would really know that they picked her because she's mentally vulnerable. Yeah, they, they purposefully didn't pick someone who, you know, had a family, had a very stable personal life. They picked someone who is vulnerable because it's easier to get them to go along. There's very little way that we would really understand that about her without his character there. So I think he helps basically flesh her out. Yeah, his purpose is more to serve Kate's character than his own, which it's fine. It's not fantastic, but I think overall it doesn't hinder the movie that much. No, I don't think so either. Uh, I think that it, I don't know, I really, really like Kate's character. So yeah. any way to shed light on her, in my opinion, is good. It also helps illustrate the motivations of Matt and Alejandro by basically not letting him take part in it. It also highlights the illegal nature of what they were doing, mm -hmm. not wanting to have a lawyer there. Why would you not want to have a lawyer involved? Well, because you're doing something that could get you in trouble. Yeah. So I, I actually think he's really, really useful. Try to imagine it without him. And I think that it's incomplete. Without him, it would almost be a disservice 
more to Kate's character, which, you know, goes to your point that he just is there to give us perspective on what her life is like. Because, like you said, she has no family. She has no significant other. It sounds like she did and something happened and they're not seeing each other anymore. So she's kind of in this state where she doesn't really know what she's doing with her own life. And work is the only thing that she really seems to sink her teeth into right now. So when she gets this opportunity, of course, she's going to jump on it because it's a task force and it's not every day something like this comes along, but she has no clue what she's getting into. And I really love the characterization of Matt, too, because you can tell he's just this guy who is not going to really play by the rules at all because the first time we see him, it's like the dude's not even in a suit. He's not even remotely dressed up for coming to the office. No, he's wearing flip-flops. There's certain types of people, I think, that are so badass at what they do that they're allowed to break rules. I mean, you see this in real life all the time. Like, there's When people deliver results, they can get away with things yeah. that other people wouldn't normally be able to. And I think that in that environment, military and law enforcement, order and uh, appearance and the way you dress, all that stuff is super, super important to them. It's, it, they, you know, they have uniforms for a reason. And then this dude just dresses however the fuck he wants, <laughs> acts however the fuck he wants. Obviously, they tolerate it because he's great at what he does. Also, though, I think that to do his job, you need to be a different kind of thinker. Yeah. Like I said before, you need to be able to think in an abstract way and kind of understand the the bigger picture and get over moral objections for the greater good. And it's not a regular type of person who can do that. So if they were to make him like a really buttoned up kind of kind of guy, I don't think it would work quite as well. Oh, absolutely not. And he's certainly one of those characters who is just like, yeah, I'm not going to color inside the lines because that's not going to get anything done for us that needs to get done. And when it comes to something as big as a drug cartel, you can't really expect that the rules are going to work because these are people who the rules don't apply to. No, and they're very, very smart, and very resourceful. I forget the size, but I think at one point it was like a $60 billion a year industry. I mean, yeah. it's huge. And so if you just think about the kind of brains that run huge corporations like Elon Musk's of the world, for instance, the drug cartels are run by people with those kinds of brains. Yeah, uh, They are going to figure out how to get around any sorts of rules. And it's much the same as dealing with terrorists. Like when you're dealing with terrorists, you're dealing with very motivated, very intelligent people who find a way to get the job done. If you're bound by rules and you're not allowed to think outside the box, not allowed to be creative, you won't be effective because they're going to have a total advantage over you. So I think the person who can outthink the other person and anticipate their moves is the person who's going to win. Mm -hmm. that won't happen going by the book. Definitely not. Yeah. You mentioned earlier how they own the cops and everything, but they also own the banks too sometimes. And there's this great scene where Kate just wants to go into the bank, demand all this information. And Matt is like, don't go in there. And she doesn't listen, of course, because she thinks this is what you're supposed to do to do it by the book. And she's still not grasping at that moment how things work, especially with the cartels, because while a lot of them are kind of portrayed as just having loads of money everywhere, kind of like that scene in Breaking Bad where they open the storage shed and it's just like a bed of money. It's mm -hmm. one of those things where they're probably going to at least have some sort of investments, whether it's like real estate or something. They're going to want to put the money somewhere and have sort of this more official paper trail. But she doesn't even, like, notice the cameras in there, and you're just like, oh, come on, Kate. <laughs> well, I think they learned the lessons of Pablo Escobar. Pablo Escobar would hide his money all over. Yeah. It would be, like, in 
the walls of people's houses and like buried in strategic holes in the ground. And what ended up happening was that when he was towards the end of his career and he needed that money that he had stashed away, uh, a lot of it was just destroyed by the elements. Like it was eaten away and yeah. just it didn't didn't function as money anymore not just that it is just business these people have families and not all their families are involved in the cartels and they still live in this world and they still need to have some sort of legitimate side to their lives and yeah. so of course they're going to use banks they're going to they're going to engage in society like everybody else and the reason i think it was good to have the bank is just to show how widespread their influence is it really is everywhere there's no getting away from these people it is crazy i know they didn't necessarily show this in sicario but sometimes you'll watch something like narcos or documentaries and it's like they actually give a lot of money back to the community too because they're buying from local businesses they're donating they're building playgrounds for kids and they're doing all this stuff to give back so that in the public eye they look great to the community yeah there are towns in mexico that are 100 percent cartel towns yeah where it's kind of like the way that detroit used to be a car town or something there are these towns that are all basically based around the cartel all the restaurants all the grocery stores all the medical facilities like everything everything is based around the cartel and they're not evil people they're just people who happen to live there. Like we said before, they don't really have a choice in the matter. Yeah. It's just where they found themselves. The other thing is that it really highlights why earlier in the movie when they went into Mexico uh, on the bridge scene, so many of the American soldiers were wearing masks and covering their faces. Mm -hmm. It's because you never know where you're going to be recognized. And the moment that you're recognized you have no idea where they're going to come at you from it could be from a friend of yours or a colleague like it was in kate's case that that dude that tried to take her out was a cop yeah that she that she had met before actually so the the uh the need for anonymity is very very real i think the other thing too is that it illustrates how nobody is off limits so one thing that happens in Mexico a lot is that they'll kill anybody. Yeah. Like they'll kill like governors, they'll kill mayors, they'll kill priests. They don't give a shit. They'll kill pregnant ladies. They don't care. Yeah, no, no, they don't, they don't give a shit. But it, and it's a lot different than how the Italian mafia runs, for instance. Like they have rules. They have rules, apparently. <laughs> uh, they're not supposed to kill cops or, and it's, not because they wouldn't want to, but apparently it's out of self-interest because they don't want to bring that heat on themselves. Yeah. But in the case of cartels, nobody's safe from everything I've seen. Absolutely nobody's safe. That's what makes the cartels truly terrifying, too, because with the mob, it's like, you know, they would have stores paying their protection fees and everything. And as long as you paid, everything was good. But with the cartel, you could just piss someone off and you're done for. That and also, um, from what I understand too, with the with the mafia, there aren't really massacres. It's more like specific hits. They yeah. have rules of only going for people that are involved. But in Mexico, you could just be at a restaurant and someone will just walk in and shoot up the entire place. Mm -hmm. It's a normal thing. That happens in some towns. Uh, some American girl was just killed about two years ago, just stepping out of a restaurant. Yeah. That, like, nice restaurant. Someone drove by with an Uzi and just shot the place up. This happens pretty frequently. They'll do it in schools. They'll do it in bars. They'll do it in restaurants. They don't, they don't give a fuck. And uh, collateral damage, it's on a consideration, which that's the part that blows my mind. Right. Because you would think that uh, if you wanted the support of the community, you wouldn't be cool with collateral damage, but they they don't care. And it just goes to illustrate how scared everybody is of uh, doing anything. 
there's some reporters there that are super, super ballsy uh, yeah. who kind of document everything that's going on. And quite a few of them have gotten killed and hung from bridges. And it's really amazing to me that someone would have the courage to, to do that. I'm not sure I would. Oh, no, not at all. And there's certainly no freedom of the press there. So you write something that someone doesn't like, and it's like, you better not show your face again, because they will find you. And even if you were, say, like an American journalist, and you went down there to report and you came back, they could probably still have people find you here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. You're not safe anywhere in the world. Yeah. You know, something else I thought was really interesting about the movie was that uh, typically movies are done from one person's point of view unless they're like one of those movies where it's like you know four stories that intersect yeah typically movies like this there's like a very clear arc for the whole thing from one character's point of view and this one is interesting because the first half of the movie is all about kate yeah and then it shifts and then it's all about alejandro for the second half and kate is almost like a a side character yeah from that point forward that is very clever though on their part yeah. because you kind of think that kate's just going to be prominent the entire time and then they kind of move her over to the side after she's used as bait really and you get this sense that maybe her story isn't going to be wrapped up but by the end of it they bring alejandro back to have that final scene with her and you're like okay these two people while they might not agree on everything they're going to leave sort of on the same page and you have that moment where she grabs her gun and runs out to her balcony and she has the chance to shoot him but i think because one he's not armed and two his back is to her she just can't bring herself to do that from a moral perspective well become a murderer yeah <laughs> yeah i don't think so that's not who she is what, what do you think of that part when he shot her? You know, I was a little surprised because I was like, oh, it seemed like he liked her. And then, you know, she got in the way. So he was like, all right, you know, you need to stay. And she just wasn't grasping what was going on and why Alejandra was just going to do this no matter what. I mean, she understands that he suffered a huge loss, but... You know, at least he shot her clearly right in the vest to where it would keep her down for a few minutes. And, you know, it's just one of those things where she was just so relentless to get to the bottom of it because of what she had seen in that opening part of the movie. You know, she saw all these bodies in the wall. They killed FBI agents. She wants revenge, but she wants revenge by the book. Yeah, it doesn't really work that way. Yeah. The scene where... He shot her. I love it because it's such a surprise. Yeah. <laughs> the violence in the movie, it's like so sudden, always. Like every single scene with violence is like it's super quick, it's super deadly, and it's surprising. In the way that it's so savage, it doesn't play by normal movie rules. Like I'm sure. I'm sure that you're not surprised very much when you see a thriller or an action movie by how the action sequences go, even if they're yeah. impressive. I'm sure that actually getting surprised is rare, right? Yeah. That was the thing. Like, I like thrillers, but I get bored really, really easy, and I can usually see things coming a mile away. And uh, I didn't in this one. That's That's something that I really, really liked. Also, the attention to detail was so so good um for instance the torture scene yeah you know there's torture scenes in lots of movies mm -hmm. and waterboarding scenes like that's done all the time but yeah they even have lots of scenes where cameras are turned off in movies and it's like super overt but the way that they showed the camera being turned off in this torture scene was it was so subtle like it was out of focus and just like a little red blip off in the distance. Yeah. But it was it was perfectly framed to where you knew exactly what was happening without it being like the way that you would see in like a Mission Impossible movie or something. Yeah, the cinematography in this is just so, so good. And the fact that that was a super bright scene, it wasn't this dark, dingy warehouse or something that these 
torture scenes tend to happen in. Instead, it was just like this brightly lit room and it was almost too bright in there, you know? So they kind of added that element to the scene too that was different from what you'd expect from a scene like that. Yeah, there's nothing dingy about it at all. It was almost kind of humorous Yeah, the way it was done. It made it seem that much more real because everybody knew what was going on. This wasn't like some black site where where only a select few people were aware of it. I mean, mm-hmm. this was happening right there in their police station. Dude is getting tortured at the end. Yeah. I think that it illustrates that there are some sections of or entire groups of people working on this who are totally cool with bending rules in order to get the job done. Also, another thing that I thought was really, really well done with the cinematography was showing the border yes. and those drone shots mm-hmm. because it basically shows that the border is like a completely arbitrary thing. The landscape is exactly the same yeah. on both sides. Yeah, it does, there's like no real, there's no real differentiation between Mexico and the U.S. I, I think that that's what those border scenes are showing is kind of that it's all the same thing. I think we have the tendency to think that it's a problem that is only over there. Yeah. It's not here. I'm pretty sure that he was trying to show that the problem is everywhere and it's exactly the same no matter where you are. And that's important because going into Mexico was a big theme. Like you're not allowed to go in. You mm-hmm. can't go. We can't operate over there. But then he's showing these aerial shots where there's no difference between Mexico or the U.S. in this fight. So it's kind of is showing that Kate's point of view is actually kind of stupid um, and or naive. Naive is a better word. Yeah. Yeah. Like she thinks that it operates differently across the border or something because that's what she was taught. So I do think that her being naive is a very big theme. I wonder, though, if at the end uh, she does move to a small town and uh, get out of the fight or I wondered if she would continue the fight. Yeah, because she's not in the second movie, right? No, she's not. Okay. But I'm not sure. But it's also a different director. Okay. Yeah. That would be interesting if they just sort of release a little tidbit like, you know, here's what happened to her. (laughs) Because you're left kind of wondering, is she going to be stubborn and stay? Is she going to listen and move to some small town? And because she's still an FBI agent by the end of this, it's one of those things where she does have options. You know, she could go to New York for all we know (laughs) and go work there and be in a totally different division. But I think given what we had seen of the character the entire time, she's not going to just give up that easily necessarily. Yeah, I I agree. However, I agree with Alejandro that she's not built for she's not built for it. Yeah. I don't really believe that people's uh basic nature changes. I think you kinda are who you are. If you're not able to think outside the box, you're not gonna just suddenly start. Yeah. It's a certain type of person but about the cinematography another thing that was brilliant in my opinion was the use of darkness Mm -hmm. Um, those night scenes yes like in the tunnel that was actually shot in total darkness like typically you'll see night scenes being lit in a way to kind of make it look like it's at night but it with enough light to be able to know what's going on yeah which kind of defeats the purpose (laughs) Yeah, I get it, but at the same time, it sucks. And this is like pure darkness. And the way that they pulled that off, it was just, I don't know, it was kind of scary. And I've never really seen darkness be so clear. Mm-hmm. It's really intense, too, because of the fact that you're in this total darkness and the night vision goggles only give you, you know, a limited range for what you can see because it's not like you have your entire peripheral vision available once the goggles go on. So you really have this sort of narrow frame of what all of these people can see. And you have Kate and Reggie getting separated. And then everyone's like, oh, she's not here. So we have to go find her. And she does come out. But you still get this moment where you're like, okay, we know Alejandro shot her. But we also know that she didn't really know what she was doing or where she was going. She was just kind of 
walking through these tunnels and not following directions. Yeah, she seems like a real pain in the ass <laughs> to, to work with. I heard that the infrared scene, mm-hmm. that they were actually using infrared for okay. that. That's why. Because you notice that it didn't look like the way that a lot of night vision or infrared looks in movies where yeah. it like looks super cool. Mm-hmm. It looked kind of like weird and grainy and and almost like a camcorder yeah. kind of look. I think they were oh what i heard is they were actually using infrared they were like they were shooting it authentically the only thing that i think was inauthentic were the footprints but i think that that was just a storytelling device like yeah. you remember the footprints in the tunnel yeah sometimes you have to be able to forgive little things like that because you're like okay yeah whatever <laughs> i thought it was badass i thought it was totally badass uh roger deakins that's the cinematographer i think he's arguably like the greatest living cinematographer. He's done so much incredible work. I consider him the basically the Hans Zimmer of cinematography. Yeah, I've been seeing his name pop up more and more these days because cinematography wasn't really something I paid super close attention to before I started watching more movies within, I would say, the last year or two. And especially with discussing them on the podcast, I was like, okay, you know, I should pay attention more to some of the technical aspects of filmmaking and not just, hey, I like this. Hey, I didn't. So that's been interesting. And he did 1917, right? Yes. That's crazy. Yeah, exactly. Crazy shots. (laughs) Yeah, he's a total virtuoso. I mean, he's done lots of incredible looking movies, but I think Sicario and 1917 are my, my favorites of his. But really anything he does is going to look absolutely incredible. Yeah. It's just a mark of a great director to know who the right people to get on your team are. I think Chris Nolan is great about this too, like hiring the right people Mm -hmm. for the job. Denis Villeneuve knows how to hire the right composers. His casting is always perfect. Cinematography is always perfect. Like it's just so precise with all his decisions. The music in that movie is also fucking cool. So good. I thought, Yeah. I'm not sure if you recognize this. The cello parts were played by the same girl who wrote the Joker th- score. Oh, okay. She didn't write the Sicario score. Mm-hmm. She collaborated with the with the composer, but she played the cello all over it. And then she wrote Joker, apparently, on, on the cello. But if you go watch Joker and listen to the score, you'll, you'll totally hear her sound. I think that I can't pronounce her name. It's, I'm not even going to try. Yeah. (laughs) It's a weird Scandinavian name. I think that she's one of the best, I don't want to say upcoming because she's won an Oscar now. So she's not really upcoming, but upcoming in that she's not like Hans Zimmer or Danny Elfman or something or John Williams. She hasn't been doing it for 30 years. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So that's why I say upcoming, but I think she's the best upcoming uh, composer that I can think of. I imagine she'll be getting a lot of work on some really great movies after her performance in this and with Joker, because while I wasn't a huge fan of everything Joker did, the score was just so well done that you couldn't say anything bad about it at all. And even in this, it just was something that impacted your emotions while you were watching it. And I think that's when scores really shine because there are certain movies that are so tense, I have to remember to breathe during them. And I felt like there were a lot of moments in this that were like that, especially the scene where Alejandro's in the car with the cop and they're pulling over, you know, the rich guy who is supposedly not someone you're supposed to pull over. And you just get this tension with what's happening in the scene, but also with the music. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think also the opening sequence uh, is a perfect example of that. Basically, it starts a buildup, and I think that they were referencing Jaws Okay. with that. Like, if you, I think if you go and listen to the Jaws theme and then listen to the opening of Sicario, you'll see that they were influenced by it. Um, positive, actually. But the way that uh, basically the cello and the, the drums kind of start super quietly uh when the uh black label media logo plays and then the entire next like 
minute and a half is just build, 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 build. Yeah. Up until they drive the truck <laughs> through the wall. It's so damn intense. And I think that, like you said, that it grabbed you from the beginning and didn't let up. I think that a big part of it has to do with the way that that score works. Yeah. And, like it's, it's instant. That should rewatch that opening sequence. It's so perfectly done. I've come to notice that what I like out of a score is that I don't consciously notice it. It's one of those things where it just goes with the emotions of the movie and it's not something that is distracting by any means. No. So Netflix movies are really bad about this. I think uh, not to shit on Netflix because sometimes they do some great things, but I think with the amount of content that they make, obviously it's not all going to be awesome. and. I do believe that they hire some some budget players, basically. Yeah. And there's some shows or movies that they have where the score just has nothing to do with what's going on. <laughs> like a really prime example is Punisher. That okay. The music in Punisher is just, it's like blues rock. Like, yeah. It makes no sense. <laughs> it, it's so, like, it took me out of it completely. When I see that in a movie where the score doesn't match what's going on and doesn't work with it, it it makes it really hard for me to get into it because it, it's, like, incongruent. Like, there's, like, two completely different feelings going on at the same time that it makes no sense. And right. With Sicario, it's perfectly married. Absolutely. And unfortunately for Netflix, not all soundtracks can be like Stranger Things, where it totally fits the time period, the tone, the genre and everything that's going on there. And I feel like it's something that if I notice it too much, I'm going to get annoyed. I'm going to be like, okay, all right. There are certain genres, though, where I think I'm more forgiving of it, like in a horror movie, especially ones from like the 80s and 90s. You know that the music is specifically telling you, hey, the killer's here. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, horror is its own thing. But yeah. you know what? I think that there's no rule that says that the music shouldn't be noticeable. It's just, to, in my opinion, it's more about how well does it match the the feeling of... Yeah. Because, for instance, if you look at any of the Hans Zimmer, Chris Nolan collaborations, like the Inception score, mm -hmm. that shit is loud. Yeah. It's louder than the dialogue in lots of places. Same Interstellar, too. It's the score... It overpowers everything, and there's no way to not notice it. Yeah. But it's so perfectly done that it elevates it. And I kind of considered Denis Villeneuve to be Chris Nolan level as far as genius goes and ability. He's not quite, you know, he's not as successful, and yeah. I think he's newer at it. I mean, he's been around for a while, but I, I, you know, he's not as established as Chris Nolan. He's someone who can get there, though. Get to that level. I'm pretty sure he can get there if he keeps on, if he keeps on this path. But yeah, that's something that Chris Nolan has always done perfectly is uh, know exactly how to marry uh, what's going on sonically with what's going on visually. To me, kind of Chris Nolan is the modern gold standard. And so that that's why I keep referencing him. him Chris Nolan and Hans Zimmer to me are, are the gold standard. And so... When I see something that matches up to one of to their work, I'm like, all right, this this director is incredible. Yeah. Well, do you have any other final thoughts about Sicario before we wrap up here? Bridge sequence. <laughs> it's so sick. So good. Yeah. It uh again, like the violence in it is so fast. Like it happens like in a matter of like five to ten seconds. Yeah. Like the entire action sequence. But I think it's built up for it's built up for like five to seven minutes and then it all takes place in like 10 seconds. But it's the most perfect payoff. And you compare it to like like mainstream type of thrillers or like Fast and Furious type movies or something where these they have these long drawn out action scenes that just everything's exploding and shit's flipping over. <laughs> they just they last 20 minutes and they're not that thrilling or just not as thrilling as this action sequence. It's literally 10 seconds long. Yeah. 
it's very, very well done. And you can tell that with some more mainstream stuff. It's like, okay, Fast and Furious movies are kind of following a formula at this point. It's like they try to do things bigger and better than the last movie, which gives you these ridiculous action scenes. And granted, I will sit down and watch a Fast and Furious movie if I want to. And it's one of those things where those movies don't make you think think about the action quite as much as something like Sicario does because this just feels so much more real than cars being dropped out of planes and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, I'll watch movies like that too sometimes, but it's uh there's just something so satisfying about the way the action happens in this movie. Yeah. It just it doesn't feel like an action movie. It, I don't know, there's something about the the suddenness. I know I already kind of talked about this but the suddenness and the savagery of it i don't know really it sat well with me put it that way yeah it was one of those where it kind of takes a lot out of you to watch this movie but at the end you're also just very satisfied with the story as a whole yeah and so back to prisoners that's also kind of why i suggested it is because with arrival it's also an awesome movie but it's you know it's not violent really and Prisoners is all very violent in my yeah. opinion, but in a completely different way. But it's also the same sort of thing. It builds and builds and builds. And then the violence is like Hugh Jackman hitting a sink with a hammer. Yeah. But there's something about it that's like so intense that it doesn't need to be a car being dropped from an airplane onto a train yeah. or something. <laughs> or locking the dude into that shower. Mm-hmm. And then dousing him with the hot water. Like, that stuff is so violent, but it's so short. So I I thought that I wanted to kind of give context into how intense this director can get. And that it's that it was not really a fluke with Sicario. It's part of his style. And if, if you've only seen Arrival, you might not know that that's part, that that's like his thing. Yeah, that's a very, very different movie, not only in genre, but just in sort of style visually and everything like that. But with both Prisoners and Sicario, it's like you get a sense for the brutality that's going on without lingering on it. And that's what I like. It's not like he was showing us bashed in faces or these really brutal scenes that were hard to look at. It's like, here, we're going to give you a quick glimpse of how bad things are, and then we're going to move on to the next thing. Yeah, and also you get where they're coming from in both movies. Yeah. Like the things that the protagonists do are horrible in both movies. Like Alejandro's killing a family. Hugh Jackman's character is locking a guy in a shower and then burning him. Mm -hmm. It They're horrible things, but you totally get it. Of course, that's what they're doing. Yeah. That's like, what else would they do in that in that scenario? Exactly. Well, I think that's a great place to wrap this up. A.L., thank you cool. so much for coming on to talk about Sicario today. Thank you for having me. All right, everyone. That does it for this episode of Welcome to Geekdom. If you want to support the podcast, you can do so through our Patreon. You can sign up for a dollar a month. That'll get you a thank you on the show. Two dollars a month. You get to pick a topic that myself and a guest will discuss on the show. For five dollars a month, you can join the Welcome to Geekdom Slack group where you can talk to myself and various guests who have been on the show. If you want to follow us on socials, you can do so at Geekdom Pod on Twitter and at Welcome to Geekdom on Instagram and Facebook. If you feel inclined, please do give us a review on iTunes, Google Podcasts, wherever you listen. It really does help the show. And as always, thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.